there we go so it'll be on my end go ahead all righty um so the uh you go you create an adaptive page and, and when you start editing you'll now start getting this uh brand new little like onboard wizard thing um the first thing it'll do is ask you to name that page that you were uh um about to author um, and then the next question is whether you want that basic authoring or the advanced authoring. Uh, we'll be sticking with the advanced authoring today. I mean, the basic authoring. The advanced authoring, if you've done anything in the adaptive authoring environment before, like it's that existing thing that you've seen before. Um, right now, you can only do landscape. The idea is that we'll have portrait versions eventually too. So you go through that, and it'll start setting up a, uh, a page for you. Um, and when you go and edit it, the first thing you see now is this flowchart view, and the flowchart view is meant to give you a visual representation of your lesson um, with all the screens in it. And, and maybe I should just mention that for a moment. You know, this is a single Taurus page, but it's consisted of many adaptive screens. So you'll have a screen shown to the learner, um, and they'll put, they'll transition between multiples multiple screens. Um, there can be branching between screens and that sort of thing, and, and we'll get into some more details there. Um, so this is where I can create the overall journey through the content. Um, oftentimes, you know, there'll be a main like happy path for when the student's doing well. Maybe there'll be like some learn more paths if they want to get deeper into some of the content. Um, if they're not doing good, maybe there's some like reteaching paths that they go through and come back to that main happy path. Um, you could also do branching for like common errors and that sort of thing. So if there's a, a if you know a common response that is due to a, you know some sort of bad reasoning you can correct that in a branch and then come back to your, your main branch and that sort of things um but all of those things all that branching so each of these screens represents one thing that the uh that the learner would look at at a time it can have, you have text and images and videos and questions and all that sort of stuff um i'm going to go ahead and drag a multiple choice screen down here and put it right in the middle um, so now this kind of little demo lesson we have has three screens in it. You'd start on the welcome screen, you'd go to the multiple choice screen, then finally a finishing end screen. Um, so if we go in and we edit that multiple choice screen, the uh, first thing it's going to ask you to do is pick a template. Um, you don't have to pick a template, you can hit skip, but if you kind of want to have a quick, easy layout, um, you know, I didn't want to create a multiple choice first. I had a, uh, I had a plan here. I want to make a text input screen first. So we're going to go back and do that. Okay. So now I'm going to select a text input screen. Uh, I'll just pick this one here with the, the image on it. Um, and so here's my template. It just got some placeholder text in there. It's got a placeholder image. Um, on the right hand of the screen here is a properties panel. And this is where I can go and change various things about this screen, about the lesson, about components that are selected. Um, one of the the important things to do is think about scoring and how you want each screen to be scored. Um, so you can put a max score for each screen, and I'll talk about like how that scoring works in a few minutes. Um, to modify things, you can just click on them. On the right over here, it'll switch to that component, and you can change individual things about that component. You can drag them around the screen, position them, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, like in the images here, I go through and I had already uploaded a bunch of images, so that's why they exist there, but I can add my little kitten in there. Um, more importantly, the, the actual interactive elements on the screen, when I edit those, um, I'll get kind of more learning focused um, uh, inputs over here. So like I can have a question prompt, like uh, what's the orange colored fruit called? Obviously, the answer would be an orange. Um, and so down here, I can define what the correct answer is. So I'm just going to say that somehow this must contain the word orange. And it, it'll ignore capital, lowercase, if there's other words around. It just has to contain that word orange. That's all it's saying there. Um, yeah, I'll just fill this in here so that it says type here instead of the, the lower Ipsum text. Um, I spelled orange wrong. Look at that. OK. Um, so now if I went and I previewed this lesson, it would know that this question here um, is looking for the, the text orange in it. 
Um, it has some default feedback in, but I can add in some correct and incorrect feedback if I want to um, have specific feedback for, um, you know, for this question. Uh, I'll just say great job for uh, correct and that's not right for incorrect. Um, if we preview that lesson, the first thing it's going to do is it goes through and it checks my entire um, my entire my entire page here for uh, um, validation rules. And right now, my welcome screen and my end screen don't actually validate because I haven't gone in and authored those. Um, but that's okay. We're just going to preview anyways. I'll show you some results of those validations in a few minutes as well. Um, so this was just my simple little welcome screen. And then we go to the next screen. Um, it's got my kitten. It's got the question here. Um, these basic authoring, they're, they're all, all of the question screens are based on a three-try workflow for the learner. So they get up to three tries to get it correct. Um, if they get it correct on the first try, they get full credit. So they get whatever that score value is in. If they get on the second, they get half credit. And third, they don't get any credit and it moves them on. Um, so if I just go in here and, and uh, just don't type in anything, it's going to give me that incorrect feedback. If I type in orange, it's going to go ahead and give me the correct feedback and move me on. Um, if I had gotten it wrong three times, it would have told me the answer. That's just how all those work. Um, so now that we have a screen and we have um, a question on it, we can go back to the flowchart view. And this is where it kind of gets a little bit more interesting. So screens can have some logic behind them for what comes next. And, and those are rules and paths um, that, that those rules uh, define. Like right now, it, this screen here always goes to the end of lesson screen. Maybe what we want to do is have it, if you get it incorrect, we go to another screen with, with some scaffolding so that you can, uh, so the learner can get another shot at it. So I hit this add rule button down here and I'm going to say, so if they make any incorrect answer, we're actually going to go to a brand new screen. Um, and that's going to go ahead and make a branch here. So now I have this new screen and the correct answer still goes up and around to the end of the lesson. So I'm going to go into this new screen and I'm going to make this a multiple choice question. And uh, so I get my multiple choice question right down here. The template was set up for a uh, multiple selection, multiple choice. So, you know, you can pick more than one. I'm just going to turn that off. So it's a regular multiple choice. Um, and maybe my choices are apples, oranges, um, and maybe just something absurd like a truck. So now we have a question that has a little bit more scaffolding because it's multiple choice instead of a, you know, a free in, uh, text input. Um, I can go down here and I could say, you know, if they pick a truck, man, you really just need to pick a fruit. So uh, the correct answer is a fruit. So now if they pick that, they'll get a little bit of feed that back that's specific to that option um, and they'll be able to try again. Um, likewise, I could fail out correct and incorrect feedback and all that sort of stuff here. Um, but what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go back to the flowchart screen. And I know if they pick apples, that's a common error because uh, you know it is a fruit, but it's not orange. Maybe they're colorblind, I don't know. Um, so we're gonna go in there, we're gonna make a rule specific for that option. And you can do that by adding a rule. And then for multiple choice, you get these incorrect option oranges, incorrect option truck. Um, oh, you know what? I'm gonna go back into that screen and set the correct answer because I did not do that. The correct answer is oranges. Back to the flowchart, into there. When the incorrect answer apples is picked, we are once again going to go to a brand new screen. And in that new screen, you know, I should label these screens because now they're getting hard to tell. So I'm going to label this as being the uh, multiple choice orange screen. And I'll label this as being the uh, Actually label it, there we go. I will label this as the reteaching screen. Oh no, this was the, uh, the, uh, the, the Apple screen. So now I can see here on my flow chart that you know, the, the, the learner starts at the welcome screen. They go into this text input screen and you know, obviously a better title there would have helped me understand it better. Um, but I have two rules. So if I get any incorrect, I go to the multiple choice where they get another chance. 
If they uh, get it correct, we just go to the end screen. If they get it correct a second time on the multiple choice, we're going to come down to this Apple's um, you know, common error screen where I can teach them, you know, an apple is like this, an orange is like this, and this is why it wasn't the right answer. Um, and you could have you know, multiple levels of uh, corrective feedback and reteaching and that sort of thing um, by, by doing it this way. Um, all right, so validation rules. Um, if you notice, some of these screens have yellow icons. Some of them have green icons. Um, and there's also a little, uh, the screen is not validated label below it. That's telling me that there's something wrong with that screen. And these are the screens that pop up when I try to preview it. Um, and it's like, hey, don't look at these screens. There's something wrong with them. Over on the left here, this is telling me what's wrong. Um, so right here, this multiple choice, um, you, you cannot have both an exit activity and another path out of this screen. Oh, okay, well, I can go fix that. We can just change this one to be correct. Um, whoops, and now there are missing incorrect answer paths because I have a correct, I have an incorrect when I pick apples, but I never covered that other incorrect option. Um, so I could just add another default incorrect rule. So if I get any incorrect, we're just gonna go to the end of the lesson. You know, in a real lesson, I might wanna do something else in that situation, but, but for this demo. So now with these three rules, I now have defined all of the ways that a student can finish the screen. Um, so it turns green and we know it's good. Um, likewise, for the welcome screen, it's telling me that just, you know, the, the components haven't been set up there. So if you go in and edit it, pick a template, change how the screen looks, that one will turn green. And now we, uh, we're good there. I could do the same thing with the end screen, but I don't think uh, that really adds anything right here. Um, so now if we preview the, uh, the lesson, we can actually see the whole thing in progress and working. So here's my welcome screen. Here's that screen where it's asking me whether or not, uh, asking me just to type an in. If I type in orange, I'll end up at that end screen. Great job, the end screen. And that's the end of the lesson. Um, if we do it again and we get that first question wrong, you know, let's uh, let's just, yeah, yeah. We're gonna do it like this, okay. So um, I got it wrong once, I got it wrong twice. I get it wrong a third time in the feedback down here. I don't know if you can see it, it's a little small. Um, it's actually telling me that the answer must contain orange. Um, it does mark this as read only, so I can't go and do any more. And the only, uh, the exit out for me is to hit the next button. From here, I get the multiple choice with the more scaffolding. If I pick the, the truck, it's gonna tell me, hey, the answer is a fruit. If I pick the apples, it's gonna bring me along that apple corrective uh, feedback path. Oh. Did I, did I leave the answer as apples? What happened here? That's a little bit interesting. Let's go look at that. Wait, the correct answer is oranges. Why did it tell me the correct, I was correct there. This is what you get for doing live demos, right? Boom, 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 boom. If the answer is incorrect, apples, go to apple. If it's correct, go to the, I don't want that. I want to go to the end screen. And if the answer is any correct, go to the end of the lesson. Wow, that's a bit of a mystery. I don't know why I did that. Let's try it one more time. Free wrong. Go apples. Oh, that's bizarre. Okay, well, I have to go debug that in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, that should have gone down the, the apples path and we should have ended up there. I'm sure I'm just missing something in the uh, the rush of a demo here, you know? Um, looking over my notes here. So yeah, you can imagine, you know, using these, these building blocks, you can create kind of arbitrarily complex lessons. Um, lessons can kind of loop back on themselves if you want to like re, re, re request people to answer questions um, after they've been retaught something. Um, the scoring can get a little weird there. So you just need to make sure that you're not like doubling up on scoring. Um, the, uh, um, these can be delivered in a Taurus project, either as pages or as the, uh, the new, um, exploration activities that are going to be coming out soon. Um, 
And that's kind of kind of where we are with the the basic authoring. I don't know if there's anything anyone wants to see more detail in, or if there's any questions or anything like that. I have a bunch of questions, Mark. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so I think, you know, and and I don't want to come off as a really critical because I think this is really great, but that doesn't mean I don't have a lot of things to, to say or ask about this. So I'll yeah. take that in, in the spirit that it's intended. Um, so first of all, I didn't see that any skills or knowledge components can be associated with a, um, a question. Is that missing? I'm, I'm sorry, is that like the uh, the learning objectives? No. So knowledge components or skills? Mm -hmm. are you not familiar? Learning objectives, Michael. Um, sorry? Yes. In in the system, those show, show up as tagging the uh, learning objectives and sub-objectives. Yeah. For the question, each question can have a different... Now, I thought we're still we're not tagging uh, knowledge components for questions anymore. So rather than having them called skills uh, or knowledge components in Taurus, we have uh, objectives and then we have sub-objectives, which functionally perform the same task. Okay. Uh, just decided to standardize the, um, the uh, sorry, the terminology. So as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's what we have. Um, so where we might have skills in the legacy system, we have sub-objectives. So... But okay. but I understand your question. I think the question is: Is there a place to tag yeah. uh, skills or sub objectives on each individual question yeah. that takes us between pages? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go into the normal Taurus learning objectives editor, which is is shown here. Um, in this project, I have four of them set up, and then over here on the right, I can hit this edit objectives, and I can just add them um, right from here. Yeah. Um, in this basic authoring, I didn't mention this. There is a limit of one question component per screen, so that kind of implicitly marries them up one to one because this is like a screen worth of objectives. Yeah, that was actually another question of mine because it's it's great. For, for this, but um for summative or sorry, for formative assessments, it'd be nice to have multiple questions. Is that something that's going to be coming? Yeah, I'm not sure if, if that's going to be added um anytime soon. The yeah. advanced authoring, uh, the advanced adaptive authoring, that certainly allows you to put as many questions as you want on a single screen. Perfect. Um, but then you have to start worrying about the logic of what's incorrect and what's correct. And you don't necessarily get the uh, the nice, hey, this is correct, and this is the correct feedback, and this is the nice path there. So okay. kind of that's the difference. Yep, that, that's fine. Um, and as the feedback, the data, sorry, the student responses are collected and fed back into uh, OI, right? The data is collected. Yeah, they come back as uh, part responses, and you know I'm I'm very fuzzy on where those end up, but they they do end up in in Taurus and OLI, and they're reported back the same way. Okay. Um, all right, and then one uh, thing that Mayor would uh, Richard Mayor would not like is the uh, feedback is not near the question. So when I um, and actually it'd be nice actually if I could click next right next to the question as well. Um, just pulling that out. Yeah, there's a bunch of things about the feedback UI wise that drive me crazy. Like I have to click that next button again to make it go away. And it's unclear what that next button. I think there could be a lot of a lot of improvements yeah. in that area. Yeah. So um all in all looks uh looks good. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess I don't I don't know if we mentioned this, but really the the target audience for this tool was kind of um, people just getting into a tool like this who don't have any experience um, authoring content so that that you can, you know, sit down, start making adaptive lessons without having, you know, a week's worth of training or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that definitely uh, fits the bill. All right. Any, any other questions? Any other, uh, you want to see anything more in detail? Art, this might not be a fair ask for you. Um, you might not be positioned to do this, but it would be great to get a quick um, example pass through the advanced authoring. Um, as you know, I, I think that for uh, a lot of the audience, they probably haven't seen that interface at work. And so um, sort of seeing what this rep the, the the flowchart based authoring represents in terms of a 
templated and simplified approach towards advanced authoring um, and, and what those advanced capabilities could be, but how much more work it is might be valuable. Yeah, I mean, I can I can spend 10 minutes and make a screen that, that does some things if that's what you like. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and make a brand new page. Same wizard here. Just call this advanced. Um, it's just kind of a little warning. There's no screen size options there. Um, so here you don't get the uh, the flow chart editor at all. Um, that that just doesn't exist in the advanced editor. Um, everything you're doing is based on the this adaptivity panel here and the rules that you author down here on the bottom. Um, you also don't get templates. There's there's no templates in the advanced author. So um, all of the uh, components that you want to drag down, you just have to manually place those and and whatnot. Um, but what I did here is I, I pulled down a a multiple choice question from the top, um, and I'm going to edit this one. And I'm rusty on this. So over here is how I edit it here. Um, oh man, that looks horrible. Um, and I'm going to make same sort of question. And then just if I turn editing off, there we go. Okay. So now I have a multiple choice question with those three options. Um, you'll notice over here on the right, there are a lot more options than we had before, um, like you know, custom CSS classes. And th there's just many more options in the advanced authoring. We kind of really narrowed this down to the basic. Um, but the first thing I want to do is I want to define, I'm going to give this a better name. So this is just going to be MCQ1. Um, so I gave it an ID of MCQ1. I'm going to create a rule down here and I'm going to say when MCQ1 dot selected choice is a number equal to um, the correct answer is one. I think this is one based and not zero based. Um, so I'm going to do this when oh, I'm already doing it wrong. I authored this in the initial state instead of the correct activity. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to go into my correct state. I'm going to say, if, wait, wait, how do I do this? This button? There we go. Okay. If my multiple choice, selected choice number equals one, then that's the correct answer. So I want to navigate to the next screen. Why not, um, um, Mark? Yeah. Why not have it instead of number? Why not have value? Because why mm -hmm. God, that's a burden. That's a real burden for uh, somebody to remember. Oh, let me tell you the advanced adaptive authoring. I would definitely define as a burden to author. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you could do that. There's, there's another way, like there's, there's 10 ways to do everything here. Um, I think if I do selected choice text uh, and I, I can do something like this. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, there's there's ten ways to do everything here. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to make another screen that is going to be my. Um, we'll just say this is the the end screen if you got it correct. And I'll just put that label on there that says end screen so we can see if it worked or not. Um, and then I'm going to make. How do I change that name? Is that here? Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to make another screen. That is, um, if I get it incorrect, like some some alternate teaching that I want to do, um, and I'll just do this like the corrective screen. Um, and here, I spelled it wrong like that. But anyways, here, just to show the example, we'll call this, uh, here's what an orange is. All right, so now if I go back to that welcome screen, I can make a rule that says, if I pick apples, go to that screen. And the way to do that, and like I said, I'm rusty, so I'm remembering how to do this. I'm going to make a new rule, a new incorrect rule. There we go. If the condition uh, MCQ1 is selected choice text equals apples, then we're going to navigate to 
that new screen that I just made, the corrective screen. Um, got to get rid of that action. Okay, so now if I preview this, and I'm not going to say 100% this is going to work. <laughs> if I pick oranges, I should end up on that end screen. Okay. And if I pick apples, I should end up on the, uh, yeah, here's what an orange screen is. <laughs> so we, we did the path thing, but notice no feedback at all happened. So now I have to go do, worry about the feedback. So feedback here, um, if I get it, a default wrong answer. So this is any incorrect answer that I haven't already defined. Then I want to show some feedback and uh, yeah, incorrect, please. Wow. Well, <laughs> incorrect, please try again is, is certainly a uh, decent feedback to show there. Um, if I get it incorrect with the apples option, uh, sorry, my mind is just kind of, so here we go. This is the truck option. So I'm going to edit this and I'm going to say pick fruit, just like we did before. And then I'm going to edit this incorrect option that we're navigating to the correct screen. And I'm also going to show some feedback um, that says uh, incorrect. I don't know. Let's go see why. And that's going to navigate to the next screen after that. And then if you're correct, I also want some feedback here. That feedback should say like, great job or something. I don't know why this window here is looking so bad. Like it should just be a lot wider and actually fit all this stuff. Um, so now if we preview, we should get feedback. There we go, great job. And then the next, next click brings me to the end screen. So kind of that's the process you have to go through in the advanced authoring. What happens if you have multiple questions on a page? Can yeah. You... So then, then yeah. that that it gets harder. So now <laughs> let's say I have two options here. I'll call okay. this one MCQ2, MCQ2. Um, so before, I don't know why this is sized so poorly. Um, before I had like MCQ1 dot, you know, selected text dot string equals that. But I also want to have inside here, I want a new condition. And I want to say the second one, MCQ2 dot selected choice text is, I don't know, option one. Just call that the correct answer. Um, so now I have my correct state matched up so that it'll know if I get it correct. But the incorrects are even harder because now I might yeah. want to define a state for the first one being incorrect, a state for the second one being incorrect, maybe a state if you got them both correct. So you get different feedback in those cases. Um, and that's the process you'd go through there. Okay. So it's not, there's not like a count, a count like you got three out of four correct. So go to this page or you got one out of four. So go to this page. Yeah. So you can do stuff like that. Um, but you have to do it manually with the if statements. Yeah, exactly. Because you do get more options than just the, um, how do I do it? Than just the, uh, the the questions mm -hmm. like I can look at what my current score is mm -hmm. or or something like that and then make decisions based on that um it, it's almost like you're coding a lesson instead of thinking about what's right and wrong okay and one more question about the questions um can you add hints to the questions so that would be done the same way through oh wait so you're probably asking for in taurus you know you have the hints button give me a hint give me a hint um that doesn't exist explicitly here okay. um you could kind of build it like you know if That's they another did, yeah yeah if they didn't fill it in then show another hint or that stuff and do it through feedback okay. yeah yep cool um the one the one huge benefit that the advanced authoring has is that you can put in custom activities that you know can be custom coded. So there's all kinds of like simulations and stuff that they use in these lessons. Oh, cool. Yeah, the benefit of the advanced uh, adaptive authoring is that you you can do anything. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is that to do anything, you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, very much sort of in that mode of uh, sort of similar for those of you that have used it to the CTAD interface editor, where you're building this 
learning experience from the ground up. And if you're looking for complete control, you're trying to build a fully immersive sim, uh, you can do that. And you've got some pretty powerful rules editing capabilities and the ability to um, you know, set variables and access them at different points in the lessons. And it's, oh, well, how did the student answer this thing earlier in my lesson? Let's let's use that in the yep. subsequent space. But um, it, it really is an expert user interface, and very specialized. And so, um, you know, there's, there was this uh, pretty clear need for solving for common use cases um, that didn't require an expert, which I think the flowchart approach really does a nice job of bridging the gap. And at some point in the future, um, you know, we, we, we still have an awful lot of work to do to, to be reaching parity and meeting some current grant deliverables. But the vision is to eventually move to a place of a more unified authoring experience so that we don't have these sharp um, segregations between here is the basic OLI-like workbook page, here is the flowchart editing, here is the advanced editing, but rather to uh, take a more thoughtful approach at a unified uh, UI. But uh, in the meantime, all of these things work and I think uh, really give you some pretty powerful and dramatic tools. Hey, Mark, do you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is Mohammed. Uh, thank you for the demo. I had actually a few questions. Um, once, um, let's say the lesson is ready, could it be embedded in Canvas, for example, like through a link and your module or something like that? Yeah, so so these are just um, Taurus pages. So anywhere that you can use Taurus, you could use one of these. Um, so so certainly in an LMS or something like that. Okay, thank you. And the OLI courses cannot be edited on Taurus. Am I correct? So, so I don't know what you mean by OLI courses. I think there are. Okay. Some, someone else could answer that question better, I think, either yeah. Norm so or Darren. We're, um, we're in the middle of migrating all of uh, our, our existing courses from our legacy platform into Taurus. Um, and um, we are, uh, as I keep telling the team, we are closer to the top of that mountain than we are to the bottom when we started climbing. Uh, but we're definitely not done climbing yet. As those courses migrate, they become editable in Taurus. Um, and so we, we do have the capability for going in, creating um, you know, what we think of as traditional OLI courses in Taurus and in editing some of our existing materials. Uh, and we've had a number of courses be built as OLI courses that were native to Taurus um, that are already running. So I think so if you think of all of these things as a Taurus course, whether it's um, you know, traditional OLI workbook pages, advanced adaptive uh, tutoring experiences or some combination of those things because because these are pages we're able to actually mix and match those experiences uh, we would normally connect those back to the LMS using an LTI connection um, and that mm -hmm. LTI connection is going to uh, you know pass on the student information so that they don't have to sign on multiple times but also supports raid pass back into the LMS okay thank you I had a question in the chat, which I don't know if it's answerable, but can if you have like both adaptive pages for simple and advanced, and they're like right next to each other, do they flow into one or another, or do you have to like exit the first page and go into the second page like uh, we do right now when you have two advanced pages next to each other? Yeah, it, it would be just like now uh, we have two advanced pages right next to each other. Um, but one of the things that I actually just worked on was embedding these more within Taurus pages instead of having them like be a full screen experience. Um, so that experience of navigating from one to the next might become a lot better using something like that. Kind of tying that and, um, you know, something Norm said. Um, I hope that we we get the ability to um, extend this so that instead of making the um, the choice between basic or advanced adaptive at the the page level, you're doing that at a per screen level. Um, so you could author most of your lesson, you know, using this simplified interface, and then just the screens that you need the more advanced functionality for. You're, you're switching just those to the advanced mode. And maybe you can't edit the paths here. Maybe it just shows them. And maybe it doesn't, um, you know, give you the validations like you would, would. But at least you could get everything in one environment. And I, I really hope we can do that at some point. I 
I have another question. Uh, are there available uh, completed courses that uh, um, we can have open access to? And so we can, for example, new users can check and see uh, what, the, what this tool can actually allow us to, to, to make. So basically you... showcasing something that is more or less complete for new users. So you, you can have open and free sections in Taurus that um, people don't necessarily need to register for to get in. Um, so that would work the same. I mean, you still, there is a little bit of a sign up process to get into it. Um, I think he's mentioning, are there existing courses that model yes. for, yep. uh, for new users? I see. Yeah. Because I, I tried to log in and I, I basically uh, found the first page that you started with a blank and I, okay, where can I start or what? Uh, I can aspire to 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 make through this tool. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was definitely uh, missed that question. Um, so I don't. Th there's not really. I mean, this is a brand new. The the simplified interface is brand new. I mean, it's not even out on production yet. Um, so there's there's not like a library of of lessons anywhere. Um, on the advent, I got to. But Mark, can I jump in on this? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we, we, we know that we need to have um, a more robust set of author onboarding tools. I think that uh, one of the things that's been interesting about OLI for most of its existence is that our authoring community was exceptionally small. And with Taurus, we very intentionally have opened the doors to, to lots and lots of authors um, and uh, still figuring out what we need, need to do to best support that larger community. But one of the things that we definitely need to do is give new authors access to a set of demo courses that they can go in, see how certain things were built, explore and experiment. Um, we're not there yet. We know we need it. We have been trying on a case by case basis as people request access uh, to, to make some of those demos available. Um, so eventually we'll be automating it. At this point, we do have some examples on the traditional OLI courseware and on the adaptive uh, that we can give folks access to so that they can explore. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say, I think that this is really helpful because I've never done any of the adaptive work myself, but I really feel that the simplified version is something that I could use. So I think it really, you know, hit the mark for me for that. I have never even ventured into this before, but with the logic paths being so clear, I feel like I could absolutely jump in. So thank you for this. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, one other thing that we do want to do in the, the near future is right now you have to, you know, pick basic or advanced. Um, but having an upgrade path so that if you have a basic lesson where you've reached the limits of what you can do, being able to hit a button and switch over to that advanced mode, it'd be a one-way convert. So you can like go back and forth, um, but that is something we want to add. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate you taking the time to walk through this with us. And I guess, you know, for the for the larger community, I just really want to give a round of applause out to Mark, not just for the demo, but uh, for what has just been some tremendous front end work on Taurus across the platform over the past year. Um, the system is just in much better shape than it could have been if we haven't had his help. And so I just uh, want to publicly acknowledge this amazing work. Aw, shucks. Thanks. But, you know, it, it takes a team to build these things. and. Everyone should get credit. <laughs> um, and that larger team is uh, hard at work right now trying to get to our next release. So we are looking ahead to the uh, version 24 Taurus release. Our current plan is to have a code freeze um, at the end of June. And then we have three weeks of QA and of testing with our plan to do the release and then push that release onto Proton on July 20th. Um, there are going to be a lot of new features and a lot of new capabilities that will be available. This release has been chock full, and um, we'll be talking a little more about what all is coming uh, over the next few meetings and also starting to plan for and get some input on what we should be looking at for version 25 and version 26. So um, lots of exciting stuff from the team to come. Real quick, um, I don't know if Darren is still here. I, I don't know if we missed this. Uh, did somebody mention the 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 startup wizard? Um, 
from Gogo. Was that was that mentioned or did I miss that? Uh, Darren is not here, is he? No, Darren's had to jump off for another. Darren jumped off. Okay. Um, as far as I'm aware, we are working with a third party to. Um, I don't remember if they're working on the advanced uh, adaptive offering or the basic, but there will eventually be a start. Uh, has a, I guess a quick start wizard um, that will exist, I think, for advanced, um, which means that there will be sort of a walkthrough guide on how to do basic setup for adaptive, which will then help new users to get footing. Uh, and that will be an, if I'm correct, it will be an in program offering. So I know Darren has more info on that. I think that's still happening unless it's not happening anymore, but at last I checked that that, that was coming. Uh, one more piece that'll hopefully help uh, with more robust support as we uh, move ahead. Hey, uh, Alex, I have a uh, quick question. Do you know what format the uh, Taurus courses are saved in? In terms of for export or? Yeah. Um, are they JSON or XML or? For export, I am not sure. Um, the export is a series of JSON files. Okay. JSON, okay. Oh, Norm, you do. Okay. I do know. <laughs> Very good. And that, that capability is active. If you're in a project from the project admin page, you can go down and, and get an export of your course. Um, oh, interesting. I will, uh, we will be checking that out. May I ask another question? Please. Thank you. Um, so in terms of support, uh, if I have questions or I'm facing issues, uh, I, I remember when I, uh, I used OLI before, I had someone uh, from the OLI who, uh, sorry, from um, the Ebony Center uh, who'd uh, be in touch with me. And uh, uh, But when it comes to this new platform, what's the best way to seek support and help? So for Carnegie Mellon faculty and users, the Everly Center is still uh, our, is still the front line of support for all OLI activities, and that includes the new Taurus platform. So, um, so your, your Everly colleagues are still going to be a position to help out. Um, but similarly, the OLI staff on campus is also here to lend a hand. So I would I would continue to use Everly as uh, as your front door, but also don't hesitate to reach out and contact us directly if particularly if you've got uh, questions or feature requests. I also know Great. that for this platform, I'm going to be reaching out to ASU to see if they have any documentation on the existing um, advanced adaptive. Uh, I know Michael, correct me, Mark, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this was first developed at ASU and then it's sort of being ingested into the Carnegie Mellon publication instance at uh, OLI. So, um, I would, I need to go and see if their team has any existing documentation on how this works. So um, if you don't want to contact someone, if you want to, you know, first see if you can solve it by yourself, if that exists, that will be uh, ingested onto Carnegie Mellon's side as well. But if not, that will end up needing to be created. So we're going to get on that as soon as possible as well. Other questions? All right, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for taking some time out of your Friday. Um, hopefully you're excited by this stuff. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to see how fast the flowchart based authoring came together and am looking forward to seeing you all create some really effective and really cool learning experiences with the new tools. Um, any other questions about uh, what we can expect coming down the line for Taurus or uh, the next release? All right, thanks, Mark. Again, really appreciate it. And again, thanks everyone else for joining us. Uh, look forward to continued conversations. Thank you. Thanks everyone.